He looked at the walls, awed at the heights that his people had achieved. And for a moment, just a moment, all that lay before him passed from view. Now, this is a poetic translation from the Epic of Gilgamesh by Herbert Mason. And in it, it's essentially one man's quest for immortality. Gilgamesh was a Sumerian king. It's the earliest story that we have today. And at the end of his journey, faced with his own mortality, Gilgamesh looks up at the walls of Uruk, the Sumerian city that he's king of, and he recognizes that there's a sense of immortality within those walls. Just as these walls in Otsabet can attest, it's an Iron Age um, fortress in the southeast corner of Lake Sevan. There's a sense of immortality within that. Gilgamesh's story, though, reaches us through the literary word as Uruk now lays in the Mesopotamian desert in ruins. And um, when you walk around Armenia, which has been likened to an outdoor museum, you see all this archaeology all over, all around. And it's odd that we know very little about this formative period of um, Armenian history. So one method of investigating it is archaeology. There's others, such as historical linguistics. And the newest tool that we have is genetics, population genetics to be specific. So genetics, as in all sciences, um, it must be understood, is not dogmatic. What we know today, what we talk about today, can change tomorrow based on further data, further evidence. So please keep that in mind as we go along. Also, when we're speaking of genetics, we're not speaking of race. Race is an obsolete term used during a period of time when they had no method of comparing individuals other than their physical features, their phenotype. Now we have the molecular method. We have genetics. So we can compare individuals at the molecular level, genetically, and we don't need uh, to qualify them into these groups. We use the term population as a terminology. Now, uh, one method of reconstructing the past is through looking at um, the DNA of present individuals. So collecting from modern Armenians, for example. So what we do, this is Levon Episcopo-Sen's project, um, he was heading it, is we go to various places in modern Armenia that have deep-rooted history, such as in Sunik, which is in southern Armenia, Garabag, and we collect DNA. Uh, we also collect DNA from villages from historical Armenia that were settled in modern Armenia. So areas like Van, Mush, Sasun, uh, Alashkert, Gars, Erzurum, those areas, those people are represented either within Armenia or Georgia, accessible for our purposes. And what we're looking for is regional specificity so we could create a genetic map. It's sort of like, a, it's not a geographic map, but it's a map at the genetic level of the um, genetic spe specifics of each region of historical Armenia. So we can compare the regions together, compare with the overall picture and every other um, area together to determine how they're related. So uh, our methods are going, looking at individuals who have four grandparents from one particular region, say Van, and collecting from them, because this gives us that regional, regionally specific marker that we need for their, um, the, the mixture of their DNA. Well, and we'll get that, to that in a little bit. Another thing that we do is called uh, ancient DNA, another method of reconstructing it. So it's an interesting story here. Um, there was an uh, archaeological excavation that happened in the southwest district of Yerevan called Charbakh. On one hand, you have this um, large fortress. It's an Iron Age fortress called Teshebaini at the time, now called Garmir Bulur, which means Red Hill in Armenian, because it looks red under certain lighting conditions. On the other hand, you, on the other side, you have a cemetery, a modern cemetery of Charbakh. And in between, there was this um, orchard, kind of run-down orchard. And so as they were excavating this orchard to build a road, because of development, um, they found these tombs. Over 250, 285 tombs were excavated in this spot. It's called the, we've been calling it the necropolis of Garmir Balur. Uh, Jacob Simonian is the head of this project. And they needed somebody to collect DNA from these individuals, um, as you can see here. So we pulled teeth, um, and it's interesting because DNA itself is preserved in a few spots in the body. It's a notoriously difficult substance because it's, uh, it easily degrades. 
Normally, you need cold and dry conditions, but uh, we can make do. So uh, the best regions of the body where they're preserved is in the temporal bone. That's where your ear bones are located, also called the petrus, is located in the skull. Um, the teeth, the shaft of the long bones, as well as some of the smaller hand and finger bones, such as this. So uh, we try to extract the DNA when we collect it and compare it. Um, because these, this, is, this gives us a window through time, whereas when we look at the modern population, it gives us an overall window of the current state, so we can compare them to each other. Now, to do this, we have to be very careful to avoid cross-contamination. We don't want my DNA, for example, to get in with those samples, so we have to use preventative measures, gloves, mask, modified headgear, and all these other things, so we prevent this this from occurring. Um, now, uh, as we're talking about DNA, what are we talking about? Well, every single person here today has 23 pairs of chromosomes. You get one from your father, one from your fa mother, and overall it's 46, but they're paired up. Um, the 23rd pair, the first 22 are called autosomes. The 23rd pair are the sex-determining chromosomes. So if you inherit an X from both parents, you're effectively female. If you inherit a Y from your father, you're effectively male. But here's the interesting part. Almost every paired up chromosome here can switch genes with each other, but the Y cannot. It doesn't have a matching pair. So the only time there's a change in the Y is if there's a mutation um, between generations called the germline mutation. So this gives us a window into the past. So every male here has a very same Y chromosome as their father, as their grandfather, as their paternal great-grandfather, and all the way along the line. We have another fragment of DNA outside. This is in the nucleus of the cell, the control center. But there's another fragment of DNA within the mitochondria. This is a powerhouse that powers the cell. There's a number of little components, and it has its own ring-shaped DNA. And this is inherited by the mother, from the mother's side. Now, every single person here has their mother's mitochondrial DNA, but only females can pass those along to their children. So now we have a window into your maternal side. So paternal window, maternal window. Everything else is a soup, all the others, of an individual, the mixture of all their ancestry. So to summarize this, this is a pedigree chart of an individual, let's call him Armin, who has eight of his great-grandparents. Uh, of his four great-grandfathers, he inherits the Y chromosome, here in blue, of his paternal great-grandfather. And of all eight of his great-grandparents, um, the four great-grandmothers that, that could pass on their mitochondrial DNA, he inherits the mitochondrial DNA of his maternal great-grandmother. Just think of mitochondria as M, like mother. So uh, this way, we have a direct lineage to the past via these two individuals, and the rest of the um, DNA of all his relatives, including those two, are found in the rest of the, D of the chromosomes, within the rest. So ultimately, just to break it down again, great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and ultimately the individual inheriting this. Um, so we just spoke about direct lineage DNA. This is Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. Remember, Y is from the father, if you're male. A mitochondrial DNA is from the mother for anybody. Um, there's another thing we can do. We can look at genome-wide. Genome-wide is looking at snippets of DNA and comparing them to other individuals, those same snippets. And depending on the level of detail, we call it coverage. Low coverage means low detail. High coverage means high detail. But it costs more money. So um, we have to... Uh, look at the cost-benefit analysis of that. Um, and whole genome is the mother load. It's everything. And at the moment, it costs about $1,000, $1,500 to do whole genome on an individual. So we don't necessarily need to get to that level of detail. And in recent years, what we found for the Armenian population is that among the Y chromosome, uh, of all Y chromosomes that I mentioned, we can group them into haplogroups, um, these supergroups, based on their mutations. And of all, say, 20 supergroups, haplogroups that exist in the world, about 13, 14 of them are found in Armenians. Not all in the same uh, 
quantities, but in various amounts. We also see the same for the mitochondrial DNA. We see of 25 or so that are found in the world, we see about half of those present in Armenians, in varying amounts, of course. What does that tell you? That tells you that genetic diversity is large. When you have a number of different um, proportions of these, why direct lineage DNA, it means that diversity is large. What does this say about the rest of the DNA, the soup that I mentioned? We'll get to that. So how do we determine the admixture? The admixture is um, the um, introduction of external genetic components, external DNA, into a given population. Um, that's all you have to keep in mind. It's not a, it's a difficult word, but just keep that in mind. So there were a number of studies done in the last few years that have illustrated um, what I'll be talking about. So Helen, taught, uh, Helen Tall et al. did this study looking at um, the global admixture. It was an admixture analysis of global populations. An interesting, interesting thing occurred among Armenians in that um, the admixture was uncertain. The Armenians circled in red. Why should there be this uncertainty when all the neighboring areas have this admixture? Uh, well, either the algorithm failed because the population admixed before the number, before uh, the rest were looked at, or it happened after. Considering its location, we assumed it was an inference that the population admixed before the rest of these populations. So the very next year, this is in 2015, a paper published in Nature by um, Alan Croft et al. looked at the Eurasian Bronze Age. And for the first time, Remember the ancient DNA we were pulling? Armenia was represented as an ancient DNA source. So, four individuals from the late Bronze Age, which is about 3,200 years ago, 1,200 BC, and four more from the early Iron, which is about uh, 2,800 years ago, or 800 BCE, um, they were looked at compared to other individuals of the Bronze Age and compared to modern populations. So you can determine how they were related then and how modern populations are related to all these. And what was found was that Armenians and Georgians are a mixture of these two groups. They're not the late Bronze Age and two Iron Age individuals cluster close to each other, but the mixture of them are a product of, our, say, Armenians and Georgians as a product of that mixture. But there was a Western shift. Why should there be a Western shift? Well... The genocide occurred, and due to the, uh, the scattering of the population and um, other political issues that we're having currently in the Near East, in Syria and in uh, Iraq, um, we, have dif uh, we have a lot of difficulty collecting um, ancient DNA. Turkey, it's politicized, so we don't have the uh, information there to compare from the Turkish, the Bronze Age from historical Armenia to what we have in modern Armenia, being about one-tenth of the historical expanse of Armenia. So this gives us a sliver of the overall expanse. And if you know, the heartland happens to be in the Lake Vaughan region where we would love to collect this. So hopefully our colleagues there will get on top of this soon and we'll have some additional data we can add to this. Now, this year in the Human Genetics, the European Journal of Human Genetics, Mark Haber and his team looked at Armenians, specifically at Armenians. And what they found was that there were nine waves, nine footprints of admixture in the Armenian population. These are the colored bars that you can see. But the, the waves occurred during the Copper Age and the Bronze Age. But by the late Bronze Age, this admixture ended. For whatever reason, for about 3,500 years, Armenia became isolated. There was no common uh, religion yet. There was multiple languages being spoken. So why should that be the case? Why should this area have been the highland region isolated? Well, perhaps geography, perhaps uh, adoption of um, bronze weapons, cyclopean walls. There's a number of ideas. Perhaps the fact that horses as a weapon of invasion had occurred before this, which led to all this admixture. And we see this all over Eurasia, this Bronze Age admixture. And then there's a crash here. And afterwards, you see no admixture from external sources. So the population remained isolated. So, 
as we go along, um, we're, this is a multidisciplinary task. It's not just academia investigating this. We also have commercial sites. So you hand in your DNA, and they look at uh, what regions are closest to the DNA that you have. And you need a good reference population to do this. And we're attempting to build a good reference population for Armenians. That's the genetic map that you saw earlier. But it's still not complete. So instead, we look geographically. We break it down the Caucasus, Near East, Middle East, all these terms. But we need more detailed analysis to be able to be geographically more specific when we do this. And there's other, some of these commercial sites, such as Family Tree DNA, have subgroups called um, the Armenian DNA Project that look at the Armenians and also how their, the um, proportion of those Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA haplogroups. So this is a multi-pronged approach between academia and commercial sites to tackle this problem. And to me, uh, the most interesting thing of all this is that from vast diversity, at least for the Armenian population, we come to great homogeneity. That's what the admixture analysis shows us, the previous map, that over time, this 3,500 years, we became admixed with each other to where we form, Armenians form a cluster. Now, we can do this for many different populations. Uh, recently, a paper was out um, about Australia and New Guinea, and we found out that they've been isolated for 50,000 years genetically. So imagine that. You have all these areas in the world linked together at one point in time, as human beings originated from one population uh, within Africa, occasionally intermixing with archaic human beings along the way, say Neanderthals, and became what we are today. And so we're all related to each other to some degree. And so, to me, the reason I opened this talk with aloha is because it's a Hawaiian word for hello, it also means goodbye and peace. It's a gesture of goodwill. So to me, I can't think of any greater gesture of goodwill than recognizing that we're all interconnected, related to each other. It's Ubuntu, as we mentioned earlier. And this road here that's leading us, um, this is an Otsabet, and it's leading us to the future, isn't just limited to population genetics as a study in history, reconstructing the past. We can also do this as a study into uh, what each population responds to certain medications, at what levels. It's called pharmacogenetics. So certain groups respond better to certain medications than others. So this allows us to determine that. And so as we look upon the future, um, this is my son here, looking upon the future, um, this is all how you take all this information and how you process it is ultimately up to you. But remember that to some degree, 70,000 years ago, we're all related to each other. All right. Thank you.